Hooray. Well, good morning and welcome to the Gathering Church. My name is John Mark Redwine and it's so good to be here with you guys today. I hope everybody enjoyed a nice long weekend. I hope you didn't have to work on Friday. I hope you had a good 4th of July. I hope you have just as many fingers today as you did on Wednesday. I was walking around and uh, we went down to the, the 4th of July festival in Brevard and was walking around looking at some of these folks and just thinking today will be the very last day that they get to give a high five. You know, just a high four from now on after this. And so hopefully that's not you or anybody you know today. I hope you had a good week. Man, I'm excited um, about the upcoming church potluck, by the way. I wanted to talk about that for a second. Church potluck's coming up. I grew up in the deep south in the world of Baptist churches and church potlucks in the fellowship hall after service. And and uh, I, I couldn't be more excited to get to hang out and and have some fun and, and, and eat some food together in a couple weeks. So make sure you clear your calendars for that. That's July 21st. Uh, and that'll be after second service over at Julian Park, which is, if you're wondering, that's just across the street, right across Long Shoals, right over there. You don't have to travel any more out of your way. And it's going to be a good time. There's a lake there. I bet kids will go in it for sure. There's a power plant on it. So they'll come out with superpowers. It's going to be a great day. Well, today we're continuing our, our, our message series, Summer at the Gathering, and uh, last week we talked about transition, and today is really kind of a companion piece to that message. Uh, it's kind of about how, how we process it on the other side or even going into it. T today's message is called How to Be Content. How to Be Content. Uh, the idea for this came from Philippians chapter 4. Verse 11, I was reading it not too long ago in my reading plan, and I just read this verse. And, you know, it's one of those things where you've read it a million times, and all of a sudden it's like, man, that's kind of a big deal. I had read verse 13, just two verses after that, uh, through him. Uh, uh, I'm stuttering a lot. Let me slow down. I'm getting excited, and I'm stuttering a lot. I can do all things in Christ who gives me strength. This clip, let's take a minute. Let's take a break. You guys look great today. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength is Philippians 4.13. And most of us know that verse because, you know, we watch sports and right after the game, the quarterback will, will say something like, you know, they'll be like, well, how is it that you were able to throw a thousand yards today? And he'll be like, yeah, you know, it's uh, through Christ who gives me strength. I could do all things. And today I could throw a thousand yards and, you know, just, just grateful for that. And I got news for, for anybody that is hoping to be an athlete out here today. That is a misuse of that verse. It is not through Christ that you can throw a thousand yards. It is through natural talent and a lot of conditioning. And that, that's just it. If you're in here today and you're thinking through Christ, I might throw a thousand yards. It's not going to happen. 
It's not. If you're in here, you're 5'6", and you're hoping to be a basketball player, and through Christ, I can do all things. Through Christ, who gives me strength, it's just not going to happen for you. That's not what that verse means. And so what I want to talk about for a minute this morning is really what that whole passage means. And I think it's one of the most important things that Paul writes to us. It's this huge statement that he makes almost in passing in this letter to the Philippians. He says, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. And I'll talk about his circumstances in a few minutes, which is really what gives credibility to this statement. I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I wonder how many of us even really know what contentment feels like anymore. I think contentment is one of those things that we're, we're often chasing after. We, we experience it on a temporary level, you know. You're on that vacation and Kids are in a vacation daycare. This is my fantasy. Let me have it. And you're just sitting on the beach and nobody's talking to you. And the waves crashing and you got a cold drink in your hand. It's iced tea, all right? Let's not get crazy. Let's, let's be responsible on vacation, somebody. And your toes are in the sand and it's 80 degrees and there's a cool breeze, you know. And, it's, and for just a minute, you know what it feels like to be content. But then just a moment later, you start to realize that you're sunburned. Sand is suddenly blowing in your eyes because a wind came out of nowhere. All of the ice in your drink has melted and now your tea is too watery and you're starting to get hungry and you get up to go to the snack stand, but the sand is boiling lava hot. So you got to go find your sandals, but you forgot to flip them upside down. And so your sandals are also boiling lava hot and, and the contentment has gone. It has passed us. I wonder if you uh, know what it feels like to be convinced that if, if you could get this one thing then, and, and only then, would you finally experience contentment. This has been a large portion of my life. And, and you may think maybe it was a job or, or starting the church or something really holy that I thought would get me the contentment I was after. But the truth is, I have, for a, the most of my life, believed that if I could get the right Jeep Wrangler, that it would bring me the joy and happiness and contentment that I have always dreamed of. I, I had a Jeep Wrangler as my first car and, uh, and fell in love with the vehicle. I had four Jeep Wranglers, three Jeep Grand Wagoneers, and a Jeep Cherokee between the time I learned to drive and in 2013 when I sold the Cherokee. We moved out here. I hadn't had a Jeep in almost four years, if you can imagine. Three years. Let's I was exaggerating. It was, it was three whole years with no kind of Jeep, minus one. I did have one in there in between, but it didn't run, and so that doesn't count. And so it had been almost two years since I had had a Jeep, if you can imagine. And I began to get the fever. You know the fever. It, it's when you, you want something so bad that in your heart of hearts you believe you cannot experience joy again until that thing is in your life. I thought about it nonstop. I'm not exaggerating when I say I literally thought about it all the time. All day at work, all I could do, I was just ready to get home so I could get on Auto Trader and start looking at Jeeps. I, I, I talked to only about Jeeps. If anybody wanted to talk to me about something that wasn't church related, it was going to be about Jeeps, whether they knew it or not. I, in my head, I was going to turn it. I, I bored all my friends and family talking about the different kinds of Jeeps I might get, the things I wanted in a Jeep. My wife was ready to leave. She was done with it. She was like, I'm going to my mother's until you've sorted out this Jeep thing. She didn't do that. She actually relented after some time. And uh, this was 2017. We had a two-year-old, and we were expecting our second child. My wife was three months pregnant. No better vehicle to ride around in than a Jeep when you're pregnant. And uh, she said, go ahead, you can sell your super practical, well-running, 30-mile-to-the-gallon Subaru Forester and get a Jeep Wrangler. And I had done it before she finished the sentence. It was over. The Jeep was outside. I got a 1993 Jeep Wrangler, uh, just like the one in Jurassic Park. It was a Sahara. It was awesome. And I, and I, and I, I tell you what, the first day, I got out on the parkway on that thing, and I felt like my life finally had purpose. Like it had meaning. Like, I, like I, I had suddenly experienced what heaven would be like for me someday. 
I've got, I'm driving, Eleanor's in the back seat in her car seat, and she goes, Dad, I can feel the wind in my hair. And I'm like, Eleanor, I can feel the wind in my hair too. And we were just so joyful and happy to be in this Jeep. Three months later, I hated it with everything that I had. It was uncomfortable. Riding in a Jeep is more uncomfortable than riding in a horse-driven carriage. It would be better to ride on the horse itself. I'm sitting, I mean, it just, there's no, the, the suspension is non-existent. Just bouncing all over the place, and, and my back is starting to hurt. I've got sunburns from being in my car. I'm always sweaty all the time. I got bugs in my hair. It rains here all the time, in case you didn't know. It's not a great place to own a Jeep. You think, you think it would be, but you spend half your life putting the top back up and then putting it back down again. I hated it. I sold it after having it for six months, and it was will be a very long time until I, until I forget all that and buy a Jeep Wrangler again, at least another two years. I wonder if you've had anything like that in your life. Maybe it was a job that you thought if you could just get this job, if you could just reach that promotion, if you could just get to this level, it would all be better became all you could think about. You, 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 you spent long hours working at the office instead of home with your wife and your kids. And, and you knew that it would be okay because once you got that job, you could set your own hours and things would be better and they would be different. But then you got the job. And the expectations were that you would keep working the way that you worked to get there in the first place. Or you got the job and you thought you would feel full, but instead you still had that same longing in your heart for more. Maybe it was a possession like a car or a house. It, when you finally buy the house, life will level out. When you finally buy the house, you'll have what you want. You'll have what you need. You'll feel content. But you got the house, and it's just a house. Maybe it was a person. Once you finally meet that one person, once you get to that place, once you, once you finally get in that relationship, everything will be as it should be. You'll feel content. Maybe it's kids. When I have kids, I'll finally feel content. I'll feel complete. But then the kids come, and now you're tired, and you still feel incomplete. I wonder if you've ever experienced this. And here's Paul in a prison cell writing a letter where he makes the statement, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I think oftentimes we don't have the contentment that Paul talks about. We lack it. We desire it. We chase after it. We don't get to it for a few different reasons. I think a lot of times it's because we feed the wrong spirit. We feed the wrong spirit. There, there is a war happening inside of each of us. Here, here are the facts. We live in a fallen world. In a broken world, there is a nature inside of us that is at war with what is good in us. Because of that, because sin entered the world all those years ago, all those generations ago, our flesh, our, our sinful nature is constantly trying to convince us of things that we need, of convince us of things that will make us happy, that will really only bring us pain. Paul writes about it in, in Romans chapter 7. He writes uh, in, in chapter 7, verse 21, I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Paul understood. Even Paul, who, who was this evangelist, this preacher, this teacher, this spiritual man, had this war where his, his mind was always trying to convince him that what the flesh wanted was right. And I think often we feed that more than we feed the spirit that is good. Because we live in a world that tells us that we should want that we should get the newest iPhone, that we should upgrade our car, that this one won't work anymore, that there's room in the budget for a bigger payment, so let's do that. Or, or we, need the, we, need, we need the next thing, we need the better job, we need, the, we need all of these people that, that are going to serve us in some way, add some value to our lives. And oftentimes, I think that is the one that we feed rather than the Spirit of God that is good and is holy and is absolutely different from the culture that we live in. And the result 
of chasing after everything that this world says we should want is more want, is less contentment, is more, is, is more dissatisfaction, is more uh, of a wrestling within ourselves. I think it's often because we feed the wrong spirit and it's often because we lack community. Now, I just said that a person isn't going to make you feel content. And now I'm telling you that people are what you need to feel content. Let me explain. I, I think where we get this backwards is when we put our hope in people. When we put our hope in people, it will only leave us feeling more empty. However, people may not be the answer to our search for happiness, but the right people should be a part of it. I believe real community is an important part of finding freedom and moving closer to the only one who can bring contentment. And I think sometimes we know a lot of people and we think we have community. We, we go to life group or, or we, we, we know we have a lot of coworkers that we see every day and we interact with or we have people to go to a barbecue with on the 4th of July. And so we think we have community, but we're wondering why we're not finding everything that we should be finding in it and through it. Knowing people isn't having community. Community is being known by people, really known, known on the inside. Community is when somebody actually knows what you're dealing with or what you've been through and know how to walk through it with you and how to celebrate with you once you've moved past it. That's community. Community is somebody who knows where you are a slave, where you are trapped, where you are struggling, and, and knows how and when to walk with you to freedom. That's what community is. I think so often we know people, but we don't have real community, and it leaves this void in our lives that should be taking us towards contentment. I think sometimes we lack contentment because we're just missing something. We're just, we can feel like there's something else out there for us. There's this, there's this drive that we have to serve something, to be a part of something, but we don't know what it is. And so we just feel like we're missing something. In good seasons and bad ones, we have an emptiness because we can't help but think that there's more. And we try to fill it with anything, but none of it works. So you're miserable when your circumstances are bad and you're miserable when they're good. Can't put your finger on it, but you know there has to be more. Let's talk about Paul for a moment. He makes this statement. I've learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. Paul's ministry was never an easy one. He traveled nonstop. What Paul did was he would go from one city to the next, helping people know about Jesus. He was spreading the good news of Jesus. We call it the gospel. Spreading the gospel of Jesus from one city to the next. That was ministry one. Ministry two was developing the leaders to lead the church in those cities. And so he would put an almost an equal or amount of time into telling people about Jesus and delivering these sermons where he would tell people exactly what Jesus had done for them, who he is, what he had seen, how Jesus had changed him. And then he would go and find leaders, people that were able to grow the church in those cities, and he would invest in them. And when he felt like they were ready, he would move on to the next city. Sometimes he would be in a city for a few weeks. Sometimes he would be there for a few months. Sometimes he would stay for years. That was what Paul did did. And what he was doing in all of these cities, in most of them, was very illegal or at the very least unwanted. You see, the Jewish community was still very powerful in that region, in the regions that he was traveling in. And this Jewish community in particular had not accepted Jesus as their Messiah. And so when Paul would come and, and explain that Jesus is the Messiah, and here's why, it caused a lot of trouble for them. So they tried their very best to kill him. There were times he was dragged outside the city walls, buried up to his waist, and then had people throw rocks at him to try to kill him. They did that one time, and they thought he was dead, and it turned out he wasn't. He had been arrested many times. had spent a lot of nights in jail and in the seediest of places around the seediest of people. Paul had been beaten many times. He was shipwrecked. He was bitten by snakes. Snakes on top of it all. I hate snakes. Paul knew what it meant to go through difficult seasons and difficult times. And here he is writing about his joy and his contentment. You see, there was something different about Paul. No matter what happened, he still had a joy. He still had a fullness in his heart. He still had a contentment that couldn't be explained. 
no matter what they threatened him with, it didn't slow him down. He, he was writing the letter of Philippians from a jail cell in Rome where he was waiting to be tried by the Caesar. He was facing the death penalty. And so in the beginning of Philippians, he writes, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So really, I can't decide which one is better. So if they put me to death, it kind of solves that problem for me. And so, uh, you know, it's better for you if I stay. It's better for me if I go. This is going to make the whole thing a lot easier. This is great. Thank you very much. Roman government. They would go and, and, and imprison him for long periods, and that's when he wrote Ephesians and Philippians. He's thinking, you know what? I've got this letter I started to the Ephesians. It's not quite done yet. If you throw me in jail for a while, I'd really be able to focus on it. I'd appreciate that. You couldn't get the guy down. Everything that they tried to do to him, he, he figured out how to serve God through it. There was something genuinely different about Paul. So at this point, he'd been in jail for, for quite a while when he starts to write Philippians. And he, he was arrested in another city in another country that was under Roman rule, and they were going to execute him there. But before they could, he let them know he's a Roman citizen, which means he has a right to appeal before Caesar. Now, that sounds like a good news. He's got a, a better chance. He can go try his case before the emperor, and so he gets transported to Rome and He's waiting, and it's 62 AD, and the emperor at the time was Nero. Now, if you know your history, Nero is a Roman emperor most famous for killing Christians. He hated them. He hated the spread of Christianity. He hated the idea of it. One of the things that he's known for is putting posts all throughout the Roman streets, tying Christians to them and lighting them on fire to use as lampposts at night. He would take Christians into the Colosseum for mass executions, sometimes just letting wild animals loose to tear them apart in front of a big crowd. Nero was definitely not a great person to go appeal to if you're being charged with spreading Christianity. Paul's chances weren't very good. He, he felt pretty certain at this point that he was waiting to be executed. So the Philippians had sent word asking how they could help him, what they could do. And this is where we pick it up in Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. This is his response. I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. I'm glad that you checked in on me. Thanks, guys. It was about time. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. It's almost like he's being a little snarky. Yeah, I can say, it's, glad, it's great that you're checking in on me. I don't know why you didn't come sooner or, or, you know, send some snacks or something, but thanks for asking. Verse 11, I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. They asked him, they wanted to see how he was doing, how they could help. Paul said, I really appreciate it. Thank you for checking in on me. It means a lot, but I'm not saying that it means a lot because I needed it, because I've learned to be content, whatever my circumstances. Verse 12, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. If you don't know Paul's history, he started his life off as a Pharisee. He was born in a wealthy family, a family with privilege and, and position and prominence, and he had a good life ahead of him. He was rising quickly through the ranks of the Pharisees. He'd been given an important job amongst the Pharisees. He most likely had a lot of money. He, he most likely had a really nice place to live. He most likely had a great future set up for him. He knew what it was like to have plenty, and once he started following Jesus, he gave up all of that. It was all gone. It was all taken from him. Now he would travel from city to city, never staying in the same place for long, and he learned how to make tents. And he made his money by making tents and selling them in the local markets and then telling people about Jesus in the nights and weekends. I know what it is to have plenty, and I know what it is to be in need. And I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry whether living in plenty or in want. You can be living in plenty and you can be well-fed and have no idea how to live with contentment. That's what he's saying here. There is a secret. Whether you have a lot or you have a little, the secret to being content doesn't apply to those things. Are you ready? He's about to give it away. This is a big buildup, right? He's, he's about to give it away. This is, he says, I've got the secret to contentment. I can do all of this through him who gives me strength. And boom, there's the secret to being content no matter what your circumstances are. It's Jesus. Isn't that the biggest Sunday school answer you ever heard in your life? 
If you don't know what I'm talking about, if you, if you grew up in Sunday school, anytime the Sunday school teacher asked a question, a correct answer would be Jesus. Like, just, just you can never go wrong. It's Jesus. And, and then all of a sudden, you look great to the Sunday school teacher. And it feels a little bit like that's what Paul's done to us here. He builds it up like he's got the secret to the happiness in life. He's got it. We're all waiting for a long, complicated answer, a journey we have to go on, maybe even a quest. And Paul says, I can do all of this through him who gives me strength. If it sounds simple, that's because it is. Don't miss this. Only Jesus can satisfy my soul. The longing that we have, the desire for contentment, the, the need to be happy and fulfilled, only Jesus can satisfy my soul. He's the only one who can complete you, who can fulfill you, who can satisfy you. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength means when my world is falling apart, I can still feel content in what Jesus has already done for me and on what he will continue to do. Because my life isn't good or bad based on my circumstances. It's good because I was lost, but now I am found, and I was blind, but now I see. There's a difference. Jesus is the answer. Because of Jesus, we can be content no matter what our circumstances are through Jesus. We get focused on this life, but we're eternal. I, I, I was thinking about high school a lot this weekend because I was watching Stranger Things season three. I won't give any spoilers, but Dustin's the one that turns into the big monster from the commercial. And so anyway, I'm kidding. If, if you watch, you don't, none of you guys watch it, I guess. All right, some of you watch it. A show of hands. All right, there we go. That's better. You were being quiet because you weren't sure if you could think about stranger things in church. Well, anyways, I was thinking a lot about high school. I was thinking about poor Steve and, uh, and the position that he's in now. And, you know, I was remembering when I was in high school and how when you're in that season of life, it seems like the only thing that there is. You remember that? Like, like whether or not this girl says yes whether or not she likes you back is the most important thing in the entire world. When you've got a big test coming up and you're stressing about it because you just didn't pay attention during that whole quarter of classes and here we've got to take an exam. And this is the only thing that matters. You can't see beyond Friday night when you're in high school. You believe your whole world is that season. And then you graduate and you go to college. You're like, oh, there's more. There's partying and I go to class when I want and this is great and and all of a sudden this becomes the most important season of your life this becomes the biggest this is all there is you can't picture something outside of it it's just college but then you graduate college and all of a sudden you've got to get a job and you're like oh no I've got more ahead of me I think sometimes we're just like a high schooler fixated on one season and thinking that this is the only thing that there is when it pertains to this life this life is not all there is. This life is such a small portion of the whole reality. You see, you, you were not created to be temporary. You were created to be eternal. You have a spirit inside of you that is an eternal spirit. You, you will go on to live forever. What happens right here, right now, is so small compared to what will happen in eternity. And we lose sight of that. Jesus is the answer because of Jesus, we now have the opportunity to spend our eternity at the feet of Jesus, in glory, worshiping him. We now have the opportunity to a better tomorrow than today because of what he has already done for us. See, Paul understood that Jesus had, done, had made a way for even people like him, even people like me, to enter into eternity with hope. And I think we just get so fixated on, on whether or not we're going to get that car, on, on whether or not we're going to get that promotion on that job, on trying to figure out what, what things we can grab here in this life to make us happy. But it is just so temporary. There is so much more. Jesus has done so much for us in order to make us content. Paul says, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. And 
we've just got to stay focused on what he's done for us. We, we, uh, we have these four purposes that we talk about a lot at the gathering. And it, it comes from Exodus chapter 6, 6 through 7, this promise that God first lays out to the Israelites and then he renews through Jesus and then again through Paul, throughout Scripture over and over again that these are the promises that God intends for all of us. And this is what Jesus has done for us. And it says th- these four different things. He says, I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. In other words, I want to I wanna rescue you from where you're at so that we can be in relationship. In, Ephesians, in, in Exodus chapter 6, God reaches into his people and he pulls them out. And then it says, I will release you from the burden of slavery because he wants to redeem them and give them freedom. Because sometimes you can be out of Egypt, but Egypt is still in you. You see, one of the things that Jesus wants to do for us is heal us of all the things that we brought with us. That wrong spirit that we keep feeding, he wants to teach us how we can be free of it. And then after that, he wants to put purpose in our hearts, put a dream in our lives. It says, I will, I will redeem you with an outstretched hand. Redeem is just a word that means to be restored to your original intent. You were created with a purpose for a purpose. He's got a dream for you. And if we could learn to live in that dream and start to, start to serve him and start to stay focused on Jesus rather than being distracted by the things of this world and the things of this life, then I believe we would begin to experience that fourth part of the promise. He says, and then you will be my people and I will be your God. The Jewish people call that the cup of praise when they celebrate it in the Passover Seder, the cup of praise. In other words, I just feel joy in my heart. At last, I understand what contentment is. I know what it means to be complete. I can do all of this through him who gives me strength. I want to give you a couple practical steps today on how how you can go from where we are now, still searching, to this place where Paul was as he waited for execution. I want to talk about how Christ gives us strength to be content in any circumstance. The first one is through the power of the Holy Spirit. Never underestimate the power of the Holy Spirit and the power that it can, it can do inside of you and in your life. In John chapter 12, Jesus walks to, an empty to-, to a tomb where a-, a man is dead and decaying and embalmed and and just ready to rest for eternity he's just he's there and everybody thinks he's dead that it's done and Jesus says come out and the dead body takes a deep breath and stands up and walks out of the grave just four chapters later John chapter 16 Jesus is at dinner with his followers and he says it's good for you that I should leave because when I leave I'm going to send my spirit to come be an advocate for you And he talks about the power of his spirit. And he talks about how important his spirit is going to be for his. He believes, Jesus believes, that it is better for us to have the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us than to have him physically seated next to us at the dinner table. I think often we just relegate the Holy Spirit to a nudge when we're doing the right thing or the wrong thing. We think it's our conscience and that's that's the extent of it. But the Holy Spirit is power. He is power. And he's power to experience contentment. He's power to experience the presence of God. He's power to feel joy in a way that you've never felt before in your life. He offers it all. The first uh, step in our, in our four purposes in this process that the Bible outlines is just to know God. It's just this idea that whoever you are, wherever you are right now, you can know him personally. That his Holy Spirit can be inside of you, can, can join with the natural spirit that you have. And his Holy Spirit is so much more powerful than that spirit of the flesh that we struggle with, that we go to war with. And it says in Romans chapter 15, verse 13, as Paul's closing out his letter, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound, abound in hope. Hope, contentment, peace. Lean on his Holy Spirit for contentment. Paul tells us how in Philippians 4, 6, and 7, right before he says he has the secret to contentment. He says, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, 
will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. He offers hope that is unlike any other hope that you've ever felt. He offers contentment that is unlike any other contentment that the world can offer you. It's not temporary. It's not fleeting. It doesn't, it doesn't give way to all the annoyances that you learned that this new thing now has. It, it stays. And, and to get there is simple. To engage the Holy Spirit and to grow his power in your life is very simple. Spend time with him. Get to know him. Speak to him. Worship him. Spend time in worship. Spend time in prayer. We're starting a series in just a few weeks. Uh, beginning in August, the first week in August through the third week in August, we'll be doing something called 21 Days of Prayer. And it's a challenge for us to get up and join each other in prayer for an hour every day for 21 days. And during that 21 days of prayer, we'll be doing a series on prayer called Book of Prayers. And we're gonna put in your hand a literal book of prayers that we'll be teaching through. And I'm just telling you, learn how to pray, to pray more, to pray longer, to pray different kinds of prayers. And his spirit's power will grow inside of you and you will begin to feel contentment when you weren't even looking for it. He grows us through community. He helps us experience contentment through community, through a relational need being met. People helping us find freedom from the things that are distracting us from the hope of Jesus. There is so much that gets in our way, that clouds our vision, that that makes it impossible for us to see how much joy we truly have access to. And it's our addictions, and it's our struggles, it's our sin, it's our guilt, it's our shame. And we've got to find freedom from these things. We weren't created to live in bondage anymore. Jesus, in Luke chapter 5, he's reading his his mission statement. He's reading Isaiah 61, and he says, I've come to set the captives free. He wants you to have freedom so that you can experience the hope and the joy and the contentment that only he can bring you. And I believe that in community, together, we have the strength to find that freedom to fight that fight, that it's one of those things we were just meant to do together. It says in uh, Proverbs, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. In James 5, 16, it says, confess your sins one to another and you will be healed. There is healing in real community. We will only find freedom in community when we really fight for it together, though. You can't just go to life group and and, and just go and attend and leave and expect something miraculous to happen. You've got to fight. You've got to go in and bear yourself and get vulnerable and let people know where you're at. You, you will never be able to have someone partner with you in finding freedom from your struggles if you don't show them what those struggles are. But there is a community here in this church. There are people who have beaten what you are trying to beat, who God has given victory to in an area where you are currently in battle. And so you've got to just... Give yourself to it a little bit. Go to life group and get vulnerable. Get to know somebody a little bit better. Get somebody's phone number. Carry it outside of life group and start to fight together. The same spirit's power that is in us is in our brothers and sisters. And when we come together, the power only grows. There is power in community to find freedom, which will move us closer to Jesus and closer to to our contentment that we search for. Paul says, I've learned the secret to finding, to being content, whatever my circumstances, and it is through him who gives me strength. Paul had a very clear purpose. He knew what it was. The last way is through purpose. See, Paul knew that he was called, that he was created, that he was made to bring people the message of Jesus and to help grow people's faith and bring them closer to the leader that God called them to be. That, to develop people and to spread the gospel. That was his purpose. And Paul just knew that. And what he understood was that he could find peace, he could find contentment, he could find joy in serving his, his purpose, even if it wasn't the way that he pictured it. Even if it wasn't the way that he imagined it. I don't think Paul had always dreamed of serving God from a jail cell. The, the, the custom at the time when a prisoner was there long term, when Paul was in Rome, he was waiting almost two years to meet with the Caesar. He's a very busy guy. It takes time. And when they had a long term prisoner, what they would do a lot of times is put them in a house that the government owned and chain them to a Roman guard. Paul was, was likely chained to a Roman guard. 
And to Paul, this is a captive audience. This is a guy who will most certainly accept Jesus because he can't go anywhere. All he can do is listen to Paul share his story and share the way his life's been changed and share the good news of Jesus. See, he just knew what his purpose was and he was going to serve it and live in it no matter what. I need you to know that God created you with a purpose, with a dream in mind. That there, there, is, there is a reason you're gifted the way you are, that, that you have the passions you have, the dreams you have. God placed them inside of you. It says in Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You were created with a job in mind, made with a purpose. And that purpose will bring you contentment and satisfaction in Jesus, no matter what condition, no matter what your circumstances are. If you just know you're going to be moving closer to him with that purpose, you will. Paul writes to the Corinthians that they were having a hard time. They were just so distracted. Their culture was so much like ours. And the culture around them was just counterintuitive to everything that Jesus taught them about how to live, about who to be. And they were struggling. They, they were doing some of what they were supposed to be doing, but they just got distracted. And Paul writes in this, in 2 Corinthians, the second time he's had to, had to help him out like this. In verse, chapter 6, this is the message. It's a paraphrase. He talks to him about purpose. He says, companions, as we are in this work with you, we beg you, Please don't squander one bit of this marvelous life God has given us. God reminds us, I heard your call in the nick of time. The day you needed me, I was there to help. Well, now is the right time to listen. The day to be helped. Don't put it off. Don't frustrate God's work by showing up late or throwing a question mark over everything that we're doing. Sometimes our purpose takes a hard right turn and it doesn't look the way we wanted it to look. And we just throw question marks over everything. Is this really what I should be doing? I'm trying to serve God, but it doesn't seem to be looking the way I wanted it to look. So I don't know. I, now I feel even more unsatisfied than before. I feel less content than before. I'm not getting it. I don't know if this is right for me. Paul says, no, 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 no. No, 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 don't, don't give up. Keep working. Join me in this. Our work as God's servants gets validated or not in the details. People are watching us as we stay at our post alertly, unswervingly, in hard times, tough times, bad times. When we're beaten up, jailed, and mobbed, working hard or working late or working without eating, with a pure heart and a clear head and steady hand in gentleness, in holiness and honest love, when we're telling the truth and when God's showing his power, when we're doing our best at setting things right, when we're praised and when we're blamed, when we're slandered and when we're honored, true to our word but still distrusted, ignored by the world but recognized by God, terrifically alive but rumored to be dead, beaten within an inch of our lives but refusing to die, immersed in tears but always filled with deep joy, living on handouts but enriching many, having nothing but having it all, whatever happens, no matter what, no matter where you are, no, ma no matter what your circumstances are, pursue your purpose. Find out what God's called you to do. Discern what he's created you for and just do it. Do it in every season. Do it when the world is attacking you. Do it when things are going right. Just keep doing it. No matter, sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Poor, but making many rich, possessing nothing. Yet having everything, we've got everything we need. I know the secret to being content. It's not a Jeep. It's not a house. It's not a bank account. It's doing what you were put on this earth to do. It's living the way you were made to live. It's getting in your purpose and never getting distracted again. Never letting anything throw you off. I'm going to preach the gospel if it's here in an auditorium. I'm going to preach the gospel if it's in a prison cell. If I'm chained and there's only one person there, I'm going to keep serving my purpose. And because of this, I'm just feeling content. And I know the secret. I, I know how to be content whatever my circumstances. I'm just going to live in the purpose I was created to live in. It's okay to go out and live this life. That's okay. It's okay to 
to do those things, but just don't get distracted from what is the most important thing. It's your purpose. It's your purpose. We're just passionate about purpose at the gathering. We, what, here's, here's one of my convictions, that, that part of our purpose is to change our cities by serving in the local church, being a part of it. We don't believe that the church is, is, a, is an observation deck, that it's a, an opportunity for some people that work here to stand on stage and do something that you could enjoy and then leave. What, what I believe is that the local church is the hope of the world, that our neighbors need it that our co-workers need it, that our family members need it, that there are people in neighborhoods all around us in desperate need of what the local church has to offer, the message of the gospel, the, the message of Jesus, and that it is not my responsibility, but our responsibility to share it with them. When we discover our purpose here in this, in this context as the body of Christ, and we just work together to be the church, whether it's something small or seemingly small or seemingly large, there is contentment in it. There is satisfaction in it. There, there, there is inside of that something that is intangible. I would encourage you, if, if you've been, been a part of this and coming and haven't gone to growth track, we don't tell you to go to growth track to fill. I, I mean, I, I mean this from the bottom of my heart. We don't tell you to go to growth track to fill positions that we need filled. We ask you to go to Growth Track to, to get on the dream team for you, to fill something in you that we believe needs to be filled. Most of our dream team members will tell you that there is something inside of you that finds completion when you discover your purpose and you begin to make a difference in that purpose. And so I, I would encourage you, today is step one, next week is step two. You can jump right into step two and get next one the following, step one the following week. Just find your place. And partner with us in this mission. Partner with us in this glorious mission for our city. For what God is going to do here. For what he's going to do beyond these walls. And share it with people. And, and let's offer this world something that they can get in no other place. The contentment that can only come from Christ who gives us strength. When you have Jesus. When you engage his Holy Spirit. When you have the right community and you serve in your purpose, you can have nothing and yet possess everything. I believe you can be content now here in this life. I believe that the idea that we have to spend our whole lives in want and feeling unfulfilled is a lie from the devil. And the answer is simple. In Jesus and in doing what he's created us to do and completely surrendering our lives to his Holy Spirit and his purpose, there is contentment unlike anything else. There is freedom in that surrender unlike anything else you could ever experience in any other way. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the freedom that you offer. That we don't have to stay chained up in this life of wanting, in this life of unfulfillment, in this life of need. That you've given us everything that we need. That because of you, because of your cross, because of that empty grave, we can have contentment and peace and joy that is unmatched by anything this world has to offer. God, we just, we lay our lives down in front of you as a sacrifice. So we surrender to you, Lord. We give ourselves to you, Lord. And God, we, we, just, we just ask that you would use every gift and every talent that we have, however you see fit, because we know, Lord, we know that in you is the secret to contentment, that when we give ourselves to you is when we'll start to feel full, when we'll start to, to feel whole, when we'll start to feel fulfilled, God, only when we give ourselves to you. We worship you. We lay ourselves at your feet, God. Come make us whole. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me as we respond? few different ways to respond today. You can, you can respond on your Connect card. Let me challenge you this way. If, if you've been coming to church for a while, or maybe you haven't been in a while, you're checking us out today for the first time, and, and you've just felt that hole for so long, that hole in your heart, that desire, that need for meaning, for truth, for something, I need you to know that you will not feel it, fill it until you give it to Jesus. That's his place. He's created you with it. He's created you with it. He's the only one that can fill it. He's the only one that can bring you there. And if you're in here this morning and you, 
you're ready to take that step to enter into a relationship with him, I can promise you two things. One is that your life will never, ever be the same. That, that you, you will be changed from the inside out. That you will have a peace and a power and a strength available to you that you never knew was even out there. The second thing that I could promise you is that it won't always be easy. That sometimes your circumstances might look like Paul's. That the whole world may still be out to get you when you wake up tomorrow. But you will never, ever, ever have to do it alone again. If that's you this morning, would you pray this prayer with me? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Jesus, forgive me my sins. Forgive me for everything that I have ever done that has hurt you. Of every mistake, I lay it at your feet. Jesus, thank you for for the cross, for taking my place, for beating death for me. I want to give myself to you. Come make me whole. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.